Welcome to Codex, a history of video games. My name is Tyler Osby. And I'm Mike Coletta. And this week, uh, we're going to do a little bit different thing here. Uh, we're going to do kind of a mailbag episode. We got a lot of stuff going on this weekend. We didn't have quite as much time to put into the research of, of pulling together a, a normal style episode. So we're going to read some emails, talk about what we've been playing, uh, and, and uh, have a good time, I think. I think there's some good some good emails here. What do you think, Mike? Oh, yeah, there's some good emails. I wish w- one time I want to have a real letter. If someone sent us a real letter, that'd be funny. Do we have an actual a- mailbag? <laughs> do we, we don't have an address we could have them send to we need no a that's box. a big problem i gotta i gotta work on that i don't know how to do that without people knowing where i live so i gotta figure that out you just get a yep. p.o box but yeah, then they I, know the that, region. I think that's how you do it oh okay there you go yeah, well i guess know, i do know <laughs> i guess we talk about kind of the general areas we live in so yeah so okay it's not a secret. Uh, we, we, we got our first email this is from david and david says hey guys hope you're doing well I'm bored and have nothing productive to do except doing my homework and study for my upcoming exams and then in parentheses and playing Tetris, but that doesn't count. So I decided to do something productive. Ask you guys a question. Recently, Jonas Neubauer, the seven times classic NES Tetris champion, passed away. His death had a deep impact on me. He was practically the person who introduced me to Tetris and was one of my idols. So I was wondering, have you guys ever experienced something similar? The death of a professional player in a video game that you played or someone that worked on a video game that you played or even your favorite game. Anyway, have a nice day, fellow imposters. Also, shh, try to try not to sus. Okay, I think David played, uh, uh, he's played Among Us with us before online. <laughs> uh, David, your car guy, poutine lover, neighbor. P.S. A little fun fact about a car. The Maserati MC12 was so wide it was 2,096 millimeters wide, a thick boy, as he says, with two C's. You could fit a king size bed through its rear wing. Wow. That means that's, I've always wondered about that when you sleep in a car and you know, if you like could fit a whole mattress in there. Yeah. But I actually I guess sleep you can in, in a Maserati MC12. If you got a Maserati, you got a driving hotel room. Congratulations. Okay. So that question, though, about if you have an idol of someone like that's been in video games. And I'm trying to think about my age group, okay, even though I think David might be younger than this, I don't know, that my idols are still alive, and this email just reminded me how tragic it is when they're going to pass away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, um, like, uh, the one that got me recently that was, like, not in video games but in pop culture was Stan Lee, you know, because yeah, of, like, all rough. of the comic book stuff. But as far as video games go... I don't think anyone who's designed that I knew of, because when I was a kid playing games, I really, really loved, like I, I would have had no idea who Shigeru Miyamoto was, you know, yeah, playing yeah. Mario. So yeah, I, I don't think I've had anybody yet. Have you had anyone yet? Um, w- there is one that, uh, di- died a long time before I even knew who he was. But when I learned that he had died was pretty sad for me. Um, Gunpei Yokoi, the guy who invented the Game Boy and made a bunch of games on the Game Boy and the NES. I played a lot of those games and then like at some point in my teenage years, so in the like mid 2000s, I learned that he died in a car crash in 1997. And I was like, oh, this guy's been dead for a while, but that hits me to know that he is no longer with us, you know? Um, oh, that is sad. I just realized I got to look somebody up. So just you keep doing your thing. Okay. <laughs> um, as I can kind of look to the future and maybe make a like a, a, a like uh, pred- not a prediction like, oh, so-and-so is going to die. I mean, we're all going to die. But um, uh, Shigeru Miyamoto will make me very sad. That'll be a pretty big deal. Um, even though I'm not a fan of a lot of his games, I think Hideo Kojima passing would be pretty sad for me. You um, you just uh, actually inspired me because I did get very sad recently watching that high score documentary about Gerald Anderson or J- Jerry Lawson. Gerald Anderson Lawson. He's the person that invented video game cartridges oh wow he was an electric engineer at the and uh his work on designing the fairchild channel f video game console he's the one that made cartridges and he died not famous but he invented this thing that literally everyone used yeah for like decades the, this idea of like a removable storage for a video game that's crazy yep. he pioneered the commercial video the first commercial video game cartridge And he has been dubbed the father of modern gaming. And no one, I didn't know who he was until I watched that high score documentary. Yeah. And it's, no one knows about the Fairchild Channel F because it was not a very successful console, but it was very innovative in that sense. And how many times as a child 
did your cartridge not work? You take it out, blow on it, and then put it back in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was Jerry Lawson that made that happen. Okay. He invented blowing on cartridges. Yes. He he invented the cartridge that people would get really mad at when it got all fuzzy, (laughs) but we loved anyway. (laughs) And I have deep nostalgia for so. Because, like, yeah, I mean, how many people, like, when you talk about Zelda, the first thing people talk about is the gold cartridge. Like, it's just, Mm -hmm. it's the thing. So, yeah, Jerry Lawson is probably who I would say. I didn't realize how sad I was. And then I watched the documentary, and I'm like, oh, man, especially when you learn that he didn't get a lot of credit for what he did. And you're like, oh, and you seriously, like, set it all up. Mm -hmm. It's depressing. But, yeah. That's a bummer. Just nothing like opening a mailbag episode talking about death, you know? Yeah, wow, okay. (laughs) But thank you for the email, David. It is a very good question. <laughs> uh, our our next email comes from uh, Ethan. It says, Hi, I'm Ethan, and I was so excited to see you guys cover Metroid. The series has been one of my most beloved since I was a teen. I played Other M when I was 15. Being a huge Metroid fan since I bought the Metroid Prime Trilogy for the Wii in 2009, I was very stoked for this game and pre-ordered it. I enjoyed it at first, but as I got older and learned more about the other Metroid games and replaying the Prime series, as well as playing Super Metroid for the first time a few years later, I felt very underwhelmed by the game. The story, which was arguably the main focus of the game, felt uneven and treated Samus as a novice, like she was on her first mission rather than a battle-worn bounty hunter who has lived through every single game in the series save for Metroid Fusion. I like the idea of fleshing out Samus as a character, but their characterization of her made the character nearly unrecognizable. She fights Ridley twice in Metroid Prime 3, but in Other M, the mere sight of Ridley paralyzes her with fear like a little girl, which is not a critique. The game literally portrays her as a little girl in this part to signify her mind space. The gameplay was fun, but uh, far too simple for a Metroid game. There are cool melee moves that are a first for the series, but they mostly just happen automatically when needed rather than act as a serious combat tool to add to your strategy. The puzzles are almost non-existent in this game as well, which is another example of this game ignoring all the things that make make a Metroid game distinct and fun. I wanted to enjoy this game, but the things that Metroid fans love about the games, beautiful environments, quiet atmosphere, clever puzzles, and in the Prime series case, fleshed out lore of the world through logs are missing in this entry. Uh, that's, uh, that's a good point. Uh, it is kind of crazy to think that the, the way they portrayed her, like this was the first thing she'd ever done, but she's actually done all of the Metroid games because Metroid Prime series, if I recall correctly, takes place between Metroid 1 and 2. So she's done Metroid 1, Metroid Prime 1, 2, and 3, Metroid 2, Super Metroid, and then this game takes place after Super Metroid. So she's like, she's not a newbie, you know? She's done this before, and it's kind of dis- disappointing that the game portrayed her that way, I think, for a lot of people, which is the biggest critique of Other M, I think. I, I was just looking some stuff up there while you're reading the email, because... Why did they choose the name Ridley for Metroid boss? Is that like, is there a reason? Like my thought was Ridley Scott. Yeah, I think it is related to that because Ridley is in the very first Metroid game. So, so not only did she fight him twice in Metroid Prime 3, but she's also fought him already in the first Metroid. I don't think she fights him in Metroid 2, but maybe she does. Definitely in Metroid Prime, um, possibly in Metroid Prime 2. I haven't played that one. And then to, uh, like uh, twice in Metroid Prime 3, like Ethan said. So she's fought him like five or six times at this point. Why is she so scared of him? Uh, yeah, that's a weird choice. You know, and it, it would have been okay, like if she wants to take him seriously because he's very powerful and like, oh yes, we need to take this seriously. But the way that she's like scared of him and paralyzed, it's like, well, no, you've you've defeated this guy like several times. Just do it again. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so odd. I I really need to go through these games now. I know I say that literally every podcast whenever we do a new segment on anything, but Metroid's something that I didn't really know existed until I was a kid playing Super Smash Brothers. On 64. Yeah. Yeah. Which, well, there which was is a, sad. There was, I mean, between 1994 and 2002, there were no Metroid games made. So you could be forgiven for it not being in your brain. Because that, that's the only way she showed up in anything was on uh, Smash Bros. on 64. I think between Super Metroid and Metroid Prime. Like, that's the so only thing we ever saw her in. Entirely Nintendo's fault, is what you're telling me. Yes. 100%. That I was robbed of my, my childhood. Okay. Mm hmm. Well, that, that makes me feel a little better. This question, <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this next email is got a question this is going to probably be the bulk of what we talk about today uh, because this is a very good question uh it is from burger champ on discord mike says back with a brain busting discussion starter round one fight what nes game or series do you think benefited most in a subsequent entry or entries on the snes 
what gamer series do you think squandered the move? What about PS1 to PS2? Well, we took Mike's question even further, and we thought about like every console we can think of with this question. So Tyler's got some. I have some. The way we kind of look at this is when they says squandered, it would be like you're not using that generation's technology to the full ability. Um, yeah. Which but, which I do think is less important in in modern times to like be fully utilizing because artistic choices are made all the time these days that don't uh, don't require a lot of power and that's fine. But back in the day, it was like a big deal to go from one console to the next. There should be a very visible change, right? Yeah, and I, I think I also I already break one of our rules on my very last squandered one. But you know what? It's totally fine. So let's go back and forth. So Tyler, what's your first good game? So NES to Super NES, the first one. Uh, Metroid to Super Metroid. Uh, first Metroid game is great. Super Metroid game blows it out of the water in every way possible, such that I don't think Super Metroid is possible on the original NES uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, the graphics are so much better. The music and sound quality is so much better. The, the, the art style is cooler. The world is bigger. The screen kind of scrolls with you a little bit better. It's just 100% better game. And the first Metroid game is great. And, and, and I think this is also evidenced by Zero Mission being kind of the best way to play the original Metroid because it sort of makes the original Metroid but in the style of Super Metroid or with with all of the capabilities of Super Metroid. And uh, so that's a I think that's an example of one that like really crushed it going from NES to Super Nintendo. Nice. All right. Here's my first one. NES to Super Nintendo. Okay. Is Super Mario 3 to Super Mario World. Oh, yeah. Which is already like we were talking about this before, Tyler and I. We talk outside of this podcast surprisingly mm-hmm. okay is super mario 3 it's bananas that that was on nintendo yeah that game is absolutely bonkers for what the nes was capable of like i it's it truly in awe of, this, what the, of what they could do with that the world over map you had like the flute warp system and then like and all this stuff and then snes super mario world just takes it to a whole new level now you got mm-hmm. star road you got multiple unlocks so many secrets it's just like it's my favorite game as a child and probably now like the one i will just always play is super yep. mario world so they fully took advantage of it the colors look better the game is smoother just like oh yeah so that's my first one for nes to snes what's your next one Tyler? okay so well before i go to squandered um i when i also remembered um the zelda series link to the past to uh, Mario or to Zelda 64 Ocarina of Time Pfft, night and day like I love Link to the Past great game no 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 qualms there uh, but Ocarina of Time is is next level man and it is they they completely captured everything that makes Zelda game a Zelda game um, while pushing the game forward into the next generation and I think that was pretty incredible okay and also in every way too like art yeah music mm-hmm. like everything was improved whereas yeah. I feel like some of these like improved just the way it looks like you yeah. were like brought into Hyrule in that game. It was crazy as a kid to play Ocarina of Time. Yeah. I think a lot of uh, uh, Super Nintendo to N64, because that was like a, a 2D to 3D swap. Um, oh, a lot I got of those, some too. When, they, when it was done well, it was done very well. Sometimes it was done very poorly. I think the Castlevania series, I feel like Castlevania 64 was like widely regarded as a terrible, terrible game. So yeah, we'll not, get every, not every game it. was better. We'll get into it, but I definitely think it's got some big problems that we'll talk about when we get there. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so for my first squandered one, I'm I'm taking a little bit of liberty here, and I'm going from NES to Genesis instead. And I think the because uh, there's two years difference between the release of um, the NES version of Battletoads and the Genesis version of Battletoads. And I would have liked to see them put a little bit more effort into improving the Battletoads game, but it's just the same game. Uh, slightly better graphics, slightly better music. Um, and I think even those are a little bit subjective in some people's minds. Cause like they're, while they're more detailed graphics, they're maybe not necessarily better, uh, art style wise and stuff. I think Battletoads really squandered that. They could have done a lot more with their jump from the NES to the Genesis and they just didn't. And they took two years to do it too, which is a little bit of a bummer. Yeah, that's true. I also like, so my squandered is breaking the rules a little bit because I don't entirely know like how they did it generation wise with this one I'm about to say, but red faction two to red faction gorilla. So we're talking Xbox to Xbox 360. red faction two is an amazing game. It's really good. Now probably would be hard to play. Cause you got those weird first person shooter controls 
like yeah. for early first person shooters on console. But pre Halo. <laughs> yeah, pre Halo. Like it, well, no, it had Halo, but it was just like Halo was out when this was out, but oh, again, yeah. no one's listening to Halo yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Um, the main reason they squandered it to me is Red Faction Guerrilla is a third person video game, whereas Red Faction 2 and Red Faction 1 were first person. And I think to make a good sequel, if we were talking about like one of the ingredients to a good sequel, is to not only use the hardware, the best, the next best hardware out there, which is what this question is about, but also you should stay true to the original as much as you can so you get that same feeling. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this game was just completely different and off the rails. And I loved Red Faction too. So that is my squandered. I could I had a real hard time finding squandered ones because Yeah. I think because I don't remember those like I (laughs) they were bad and I stopped playing them and it's harder harder for me to remember. Yeah. You know, or if a game does get a sequel on a next gen console, I feel like a big thing for devs, at least now, is you got to make it with the best graphics and the best everything. So at Mm -hmm. least so there's a lot of ho-hum sequels out there that have great graphics is what we have (laughs) versus this was like Burger Champ is saying an early generation problem nes to snes or ps1 to ps2 or in the case of my good ones um snes to 64 which Mm -hmm. you want me to do my two good ones yeah so my two good ones for very similar reasons are star fox and mario kart on snes to the 64 versions of star fox 64 and mario kart 64 because star fox it's fine on the snes but it just does way better it was mind blowing back in the day, right? Like to even think that that was possible on the Super Nintendo was absolutely awesome. Nowadays, game is unplayable. It plays at like ten frames per second. It's yeah. t- it's just not fun. Also, Mario Kart on SNES, and this was even shown when they brought levels from SNES to the newer Mario Karts. It they're designed so flat, it's hard to see where you're going. Yeah. You know, like the reason that Mario Kart 64, I think, plays easier is you have that slightly angled top down camera, like 45 degrees. So you can actually follow along with the road. It's not really like that as much in Mario Kart on the SNES. It's a little bit shallower angle. So it's kind of harder to see where you're going, which is why they have those like chevrons that blink to help you turn on the newer ones. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, those are my good ones. What are your other good ones and squandered ones? My other good ones, similar to uh, Zelda from the Super Nintendo to the N64, I'm going to go, um, and this one's cheating a little bit because we're skipping two generations, but hey, as we discussed earlier, this is entirely Nintendo's fault. Super Metroid to Metroid Prime on the GameCube. Oh, yeah. Holy moly. They skipped over N64, uh, so who knows what they could have done in that generation. It could have been very good as well, but Metroid Prime takes everything that's great about metroid games the atmosphere the music the 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 gameplay to a certain extent um ch- changes it completely like like you said when you, uh, when you were talking about red faction going from first person to third person it was like ah they changed the perspective this was not great in metroid prime they take it the 2d side scroller and make it a first person shooter and it was awesome like it really really worked that game feels so much like a metroid game uh that is it it, and it feels like a metroid game but it doesn't look like one if you're comparing it you know just looking at screenshots but man does it feel like it and metroid prime is like chef's kiss like one of the the perfect video games i think like just so good that's first person shooter right metroid prime Prime is a first person shooter yeah when i heard that they made that first person shooter i'm like how did i not play this as a kid because i love that genre so so good um and then my my other one because the other part of the question was what about ps1 to ps2 um, I think the Final Fantasy series uh, does a great jump from 9 to 10 on the PS1 to PS2. 9 is a great game. Uh, 10 is awesome because the the backgrounds are no longer that pre-rendered style that they're doing it uh, in 7, 8, and 9, which looked great at the time, but now they don't have to do that and they can have like really uh, living backgrounds be- behind the characters and different camera angles and stuff. The game was fully voice acted. Whether you like the story or not, I think is, is irrelevant. Some people like it, some people don't. Uh, but the game was fully voice acted. Some of it was good. Some of it was not so good. Uh, but uh, I think the the jump between generations was huge. And uh, I, I think it really benefited the series overall, in my opinion. I know that's maybe a, maybe a hot take because some people like old Final Fantasies. But you know what? That's fine. You're allowed your opinion. Yeah. So I'm going to say uh, my good PS1 to PS2 is the jump from Twisted Metal 2 to Twisted Metal Black. Um, Ooh. and it it's funny because looking at the pictures now you can't really tell 
them apart as far as like generation wise goes because they're just like <laughs> not that great at graphics. But I just feel like, again, like maybe this was hype as being a kid, you know, and switching over to that. But everything was like amazing on PS2 when you were a child, <laughs> you know, it's mm-hmm. like the supercomputer thing that we were talking about when we talked about the history of the PS2. So yeah, I just really dug that game. And yeah. Twisted Metal 2, already great. Twisted Metal Black, even better. Yep. I'm here for oh, it. The Tony Hawk series is like that too. Tony Hawk 2 to Tony oh, Hawk 3. Yeah. Uh, um, great. The Tony Hawk 3, like the levels were bigger. They were kind of a little bit open world in that you you had a little bit more to do and like there's a little bit more interaction going on. Uh, yeah, that game, that generational jump is great. And you can see what they would have done, well, what they did do because that game also came out on the PS1 and it was uh, pretty similar, but but also different. Like the PS2 version is very clearly the superior yeah, version. I really like when we do episodes and we get to talk about games that came out on previous generations and how much they had to like negotiate with themselves of what they're going to cut and what they're going to keep. Yeah. <laughs> and that, so it's, it's nice to be able to see like what, how it gives you an idea of how big the jump is, you mm-hmm. know, like how much they're doing. And I think you talked about that with call of duties about how some of them, like they kept coming out on the system before and it's like, this is a bad game. Like you shouldn't be doing this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Call of Duty three on the original Xbox. Not great. And, and, and that's the best version of the, uh, of like the previous generation. Like if you play Call of Duty three on the PS two, you had a really bad time. <laughs> Even yeah. though it was like more or less the same game, it was a pretty bad time. It's a bad experience. So, uh, I think we got one more email left, right? Oh, I got, I got one more squandered. Oh, I'm PS1 so to sorry. PS2. I am that's jumping okay. ahead of myself. Oh, wait. Oh, I have one more great PS1 to PS2. Grand Theft Auto. I love Enough this. Said. Yeah. Enough said. GTA 2, fun game, very goofy, awesome. GTA 3, possibly the most influential video game, modern video game of all time. Oh, uh, yeah. Hot, hot take. Hot take, maybe. Uh, I think there's an argument to be made there. I think uh, that's a strong argument to be made, and I find that it's because of that, it is a temperate to warm take, you know? Yeah, okay, okay. Like, because people will argue with you about it, but they're not they're, you're not wrong. There's no way you're wrong. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then another uh, squandered is uh, I have two series here. I think the Dance Dance Revolution series from PS1 to PS2. You know what? You just made the same game again. And I guess that's fine for DDR, but you you squandered it. Okay. Uh and then you got the other you got squandered. You could if you you could have done more and you chose not to. Uh, another one. Uh, the Crash and Spyro series, um, they changed developers when they moved into the PS2 generation for both of those games because the licenses were owned by Universal, and so they just gave it to other companies to make games, and they were just not as good. Maybe the graphics were better, but they just weren't. They just didn't have the same heart, so they squandered their their leap. I think. Yeah, okay. this might this might be one of those topics we come back to because I am curious about um, Sega Master System to Genesis because there's got to be some big jumps in there. Oh, right. and there's some backports too. Like when Sonic the Hedgehog came out on Genesis, they also made a Master System version. Yeah, um, and it's hard to say that it, the the generational leap between the Sonic Adve- Sonic not Sonic Adventure Sonic One on the Master System Master System to the Genesis is a much like the Genesis version is a much better game, but it's also hard to compare it to generational jump because they sort of backported it. It like came out on the Genesis and then it came out on the Master System. So yeah. But there could be something there in the future. I love this question, yeah. though. Great question, Burger Champ. Yeah. You're the champion of burgers, my friend. Yep. Uh, okay, so we got one more email. Uh, this one is from Alexa. Alexa says, Hey, guys, my name is Alexa, and I have start- and I started listening to your podcast around two months ago. I moved away from where I work, so now I have an hour-long commute. The podcast I was listening to beforehand ended, and I needed something new, but nothing I found was doing it for me, mainly because all of the ones I was interested in weren't the right length for my commute. Then I found your podcast and was immediately hooked. I love the way you guys talk with each other about your subjects. There's just so much charm oozing out of both of you and the occasional Toby appearance. I've found myself on several occasions imagining contributing my own uh, to the episodes on topics I know a whole lot about, like Pokemon, for instance. I'm on episode 70, so about halfway through your catalog, but I'm hooked. I always look forward to driving to work with my coffee and breakfast and listening to an episode of your podcast. You guys do such a fantastic job, and I wholeheartedly believe y'all deserve a buttload of viewership. Uh, please keep up the great work, and I wish both of you all the best. Alexa. Thanks, Alexa. That's very Thank nice of you to say that. I feel bad now because she says she has an hour-long commute, and we're releasing a 25-minute episode. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe <laughs> well, you can burn through a couple twice. of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, burn through a couple. 
Or just uh, switch to the radio. You know, they need the they need the listenership, the radio, right? Terrestrial yeah, I radio. Suppose. Yeah. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay. Well, that was that was. That, I feel I feel pretty happy about that. Sorry for the short episode, but it's also you know we need a break sometimes. We need to, we yeah. need to take a little breathers as people mm-hmm, do. Mm-hmm. Um, so. We'll be back next week with your regularly scheduled um, research on some topic, or topic that we don't know yet. It's still a surprise, I think, Tyler. Right? We're yeah, still, still a su- surprise. Still a surprise. But don't get don't get like hyped for it. It's not like a surprise surprise. It's just I don't know what it is yet. Yeah, we also are getting some like <laughs> great ideas on Discord for future episodes. Yeah. So I'm gonna like say some of these ideas that were teased to kind of just like you know make people get ex- this is this is called uh, what's this? This is like. Hype train. We're hype training right now. This mm-hmm. is what professional podcasters do, right? They hype yeah. train it. All this right? is what we call a pro podcaster move. Pro podcaster move. Usually they don't take that long to get into it. Okay. Uh, Team Fortress 2 was thrown out as an idea mm. because mm-hmm. that's a pretty crazy with free to play. Um, yep. Weird arcade games. The example that Burger Champ throws out is Boonga, Boonga, B O O N G dash G A twice. Boonga Boonga. Boonga Boonga. Yeah. Mm, never played it. And then we have a new Discord person named Snoogins, and they threw out Earthbound. How have we not done Earthbound? I can't believe we've never done Earthbound. Yeah, or even talked about it. So that, that's going to be coming down the pipe, those three things, I think. Those are some great ideas. So stay tuned. That was your daily dose of podcast hype. If you want to email us, you can email us at codexhistorypodcast at gmail.com. You can join our Discord by going to our Twitters. I'm at me, Coletta. Tyler is at Sneaker Elf, E-L-P-H. Or if you want to just email us, I'll send you the link. And with that, I think that's that's it, right, Tyler? We did it. I think that about covers it, yeah. Thank you all so much for listening, and Tyler will now say goodbye to you very formally. Farewell.